welcome to this this new session of the One World. Uh, I'm going to share some of the slide. I don't know if you can see this. Don't maybe. Can you share your screen? We don't hear you, don't. Thank you very much. So I'm Valerie Camus, the new head of the Communication Committee of the Psychonomic Society, and I'm very pleased to welcome you in this new edition of the World World Cognitive Psychology Seminar Series. The moderator of today's seminar will be Dawn, that you can maybe, uh, that you will see uh, lately. She's Associate Professor at Tex NMA University in San Antonio, and she works on memory, attention, and perception. She is in the committee since 2001, and she joined the Psychonomic Society in 2009. Today, it's my very great pleasure, please change, to introduce Art. And not only because we share a passion for seaside and selling, but for its incredible research in embodied cognition. He developed and test theory in language comprehension and very interestingly is working on solving real world problems. And this is most of this talk that is going to do today. Uh, his prolific career uh, lead him to work at the University of Wisconsin Medicine and also at Arizona State University where he has now emeritus appointments. And it also have great honorary appointments in Spain, Salamanca, and Germany in Tumbigen. Please change the slide. He had a very long association with the society, and I'm really jealous of him to have this T-shirt showing this, because he joined the society in 1968, about. And the main thing, I think, probably also in his life, is that he, he find I mean, he met his wife, Mina, during a meeting at the Psychonomic Society, and I think we should alight a little bit more all the social relationship that the society allowed, uh, and more than the and also the science on it. So it's great pleasure to have you here, Hart, and I really look forward to hearing your talk. And well, thank you very much. Um, and now for the hardest part, which is uh, sharing my screen and getting everything to uh, to work out right. Um, see if I can do that. And hopefully now you can see my title slide, but you can't see my notes. That those are just for me. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, great. And you can hear me okay? Absolutely. Great. Then I'm going to start. Thank um, you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thanks to the society uh, for this invitation. It, it really is uh, looking forward to presenting um, this research um, to, uh, to members of the society and cognitive psychologists, um, hopefully around the world. So um, let me start out with a question that I would imagine many cognitive psychologists uh, have an answer for, um, and that's what, what are brains for? And, and I would imagine a lot of people would say, well, oh, brains are for thinking, you know, of, of course that's what brains are for. But let's see what the noted biologist and neuroscientist Rudolfo Yainas has to say about this. Um, and he says, he writes that, a nervous system is only necessary for multicellular creatures that can orchestrate and express active movement. And in fact, we all know, for example, a very successful uh, multicellular organisms, uh, like for example, trees, but if they don't express active movement, they don't seem to have a nervous system. They don't seem to have a brain. And Yinus illustrates this with a, a wonderful example of this little creature. It's a sea squirt. Uh, this is the sea squirt in the larval stage. And the sea squirt, can you see my, uh, my cursor? Great. 
Um, the sea squirt is a cousin of ours. It's in the same phylum of chordata because it has a, a primitive um, spinal cord. Um, and you can see it also has an eye spot and, and, a, and a simple brain. Um, and the sea squirt um, um, travels around uh, in this larval stage until it finds a suitable place to attach. And then once it attaches, it morphs into this thing that looks like a plant, but in fact, it's an animal. Um, it has an animal's digestive system, for example. But interestingly, once it attaches and morphs like this, it never again expresses active movement. It never, you know, waves and goes in the waves, but it doesn't move itself. And here's the interesting part. Once the sea squirt attaches and starts to morph, one of the first things it does is to ingest its brain. And the point is that if it doesn't need to move, it doesn't need a brain, that brains are for action. And so what I want to do in this talk is to take this claim and move it from the ski sea squirt up to humans and then to move it into the classroom and see how far we can get along that journey. And the way I'm going to do that is through the notion of embodied cognition. And what I mean by embodied cognition is that all cognitive processes, and I mean all cognitive processes, including those abstract processes used in language and mathematics, are based on bodily and neurosystems of action, not action alone. Action, I think, is most important or, or amongst the most important, but based on bodily and neural systems of action, perception, and emotion. So that's what I mean by embodied cognition. And then how do we, how do we apply that to education? And what I'm going to claim is that to be understandable and useful, that the abstract symbols of education, the things we learn that we value in education, words and syntax for language and numbers and operators for mathematics, that those abstract symbols of education must be grounded in experiences of action, perception, and emotion. So I'm going to go from body cognition to the classroom. And I'm going to do it through these steps. I'm first going to talk a little bit about embodied cognition and language, and then uh, apply that to uh, tell you about some research that I've done on developing an embodied reading comprehension intervention. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about embodied cognition and STEM learning, where STEM is uh, an acronym for science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and then have a few conclusions. So what, what does that mean to have an embodied theory of language comprehension? Well, the claim, the basic claim, is that language comprehension is not the manipulation of abstract symbols, um, you know, the sorts of symbols that we might find in a computer program. Um, or the sorts of symbols that we find in many, many theories of cognition. Um, but language comprehension is not that. It's not the manipulation of those symbols. Instead, comprehension understanding results from simulating the content of the language using neural and bodily systems of action, perception, and emotion. Let me give you an example to try to make that a bit clearer. So how do we understand a sentence like, you and your lover hold hands while walking on the moonlit tropical beach? Well, according to this idea of embodied language comprehension and simulation, we use words like walking to drive our motor system into states that are homologous, that are similar to 
the states that the motor system has when literally walking. So we use the words to drive the neural system. And that driving is what we mean by stimulating. And more simply, it's imagining. You know, it's, it's, it's almost certainly what we do when we're imagining. We use words like the moonlit tropical beach to drive our perceptual system, to drive our visual system into states that are similar to, to where, those, where they are when we're actually walking on a moonlit tropical beach. And similarly, we use words like you and your lover hold hands to drive our emotional system so that we understand the emotional connotations of this sense. Well, it turns out that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research that supports these ideas. And I'm just going to barely scratch the surface of some of that research just to give you a sense for how it can be done. And one of my favorite is demonstrating the relation between language and the action system. This early work by Hauk, John Trude, and Pulvermuller, um, where they had people um, in an MRI machine. And so they're looking at brain activity while the people are simply listening to words like lick, pick, and kick. And they made the most amazing discovery that when people were listening to an action verb like lick, not only was the brain active, not only was the motor system active, but it was particularly active in that part of the motor system that controls the mouth. And for a word like pick, it was that part of the motor system that controls the hands and similarly for kick. And so the conclusion from this sort of research is when understanding sentences about action, we use areas of the brain that control little, literal action. We use those areas to simulate action. Similarly, we have story, similar stories uh, regarding the perceptual system. And again, oh, there's a, a lot of amazing research that, that demonstrates this. But since this is my talk, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that I've done. Um, and this is uh, another um, fMRI experiment. And uh, in this experiment, we had people first looking at stimuli that appeared to be approaching or appeared to be moving away versus static, non-moving stimuli. And we saw those parts of the brain that are particularly activated by visual motion. And you, you see that in the slide here. And it, not at all surprising because those are the parts of the brain called V5 or the MT, uh, that visual scientists had already identified as being important for the analysis of visual motion. Here's what we then did. We had people listen to sentences that described motion toward or motion away, such as the car is approaching you versus the car is, is going away, or static sentences, the car is large, and we looked at what parts of the brain um, responded particularly to sentences describing visual motion. And what you can see is at least for the toward sentences, the same areas of the brain were particularly active when analyzing sentences describing visual motion, as in when analyzing visual motion itself. Now, clearly, we didn't get very strong results for the away sentences, but at least we can say that when understanding language about visible motion, areas of the brain used in perception of visual motion are used at least some of the time to simulate motion. And um, a, a similar story um, can be told about emotion. And again, one of my um, favorite examples of this um, is the dissertation of David Havas um, that we published in 2010. Um, and in this experiment, we had people 
reading sentences that described angry or sad or happy situations. And the main variable was reading time. Um, and what you can see is that people took substantially longer to read and understand the angry sentences. In fact, that's not very interesting because to get sentences that conveyed anger, we had to use many more words than sentences that describe sad or happy situations. The important part of this experiment uh, consists of the participants. The participants were all women at a Botox clinic, and they were there to get cosmetic Botox in the corrugator muscle, the muscle up here that you use when you're frowning. And you might say, wait, wait a minute, is it, isn't it? Isn't that a neurotoxin, you know, botulism toxin? Why would anybody ever put that into their head? Well, if you put it in in the right amount, in the right areas, what it does is to relax the muscle. Um, and then the frown lines in your forehead disappear. And so it's a type of cosmetic. The data you're seeing right now are the reading times before they got the Botox treatment in their forehead. And then when they came back about a week or two later, um, we tested them again on a counterbalanced set of sentences. And the prediction was that they would take longer to understand sentences that required this muscle. Namely, we use this muscle to express anger. And by God, it took them longer to read the angry sentences the second time. Similarly, we use this muscle to express sadness and it took people longer to read the sad sentences, but we don't use that muscle to express happiness. Happiness is expressed you know, here at this corner of your eyes and of course in your mouth. Um, and those weren't affected by the Botox. And we see that there was no effect before, after on the reading time for the happy sentences. And so again, when understanding language about emotion, we engage bodily systems in the simulation of emotion. And so the conclusion so far is that bodily and neurosystems used for action, perception, and emotion are also used in language comprehension and, and cognition in general. So now I want to um, switch gears a little bit and to say, all right, how can we take this information, this, this theory, uh, and use it to help people? And the, 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 the people that we decided to try to help um, initially uh, were kids, uh, particularly kids um, struggling with reading comprehension. And we tried to answer the question that many other people have also struggled with, namely, why are some children competent oral language users? You know, they love to joke and run around and talk, but they're poor readers. Why is it they don't like reading and they don't read very well? Well, you know, like I said, a lot of people have been working on this question. Um, and some of the answers are, for example, learning the transition from orthography to phonology is hard work. That is, learning how to go from the shapes of the letters to their sounds is hard work. And it's particularly true in a language like English. At, um, it's called a... Uh, uh, an opaque orthography, uh, meaning that a given letter has multiple pronunciations depending on its context, um, as opposed to Spanish uh, that has a more transparent orthography, orthography uh, where each letter is pronounced pretty much the same uh, regardless of, of its context. So, you know, maybe one of the problems is this transition from orthography to phonology. Um, another is, well, maybe the kids just have to develop fluency. Sort of a sad answer is that, oh, well, sorry, they just have a 
uh, an inadequate working memory, and so they'll just never be good readers. And clearly, that's a that's a sad sort of answer. And so we wanted to try a different sort of answer, one in which we could help the kids. Um, and what we proposed is that there might be a failure to ground written symbols in action and perceptual experiences. That is, there may be a failure in learning how to simulate from the written words. And you might say, well, you know, why, why, why would that be? Um, and I think it's because when children, infants, toddlers are learning to speak and listen, that the mapping of the symbol to the perceptual and action experience is very frequent. Um, let me give you an example. So when you have, I have to adjust my screen here so you can see this. So when you have a, uh, let's say a mother getting ready to feed her infant, um, you don't have the, the mother, you know, say something like infant, this is a bottle. A bottle is a, is a container made out of plastic or, or glass that holds a nutritive substance, right? That's not the way mothers talk. What their mother does is they say, here's your bottle. And then along with bottle, the infant sees the bottle, feels the bottle, gets the emotional connection to the mother. And so the word bottle is mapped to those action and perception and emotional experiences. And that happens for a lot of words in initial learning. Let me give another example. For example, you might you know, have a father say uh, to a child, wave bye-bye. Right, a father never says that, wave bye-bye like that. The father says, wave bye-bye, wave bye-bye, and shows what that means. On the other hand, consider the situation when children are learning to read. This sort of grounding in perceptual sensory motor systems is very rare. You have a child with a book in front of him, and he may be trying to pronounce the words and going something like, dog. And the teacher says, right, dog, what's the next word? Right, and there are no real dogs there. There's no tail wagging, there's no petting. And so what children are being taught is that reading is a process of pronouncing these words rather than pronouncing them and using that pronunciation and using the visual symbol to simulate what the words are about. And so it seems like to the extent that children do not effectively ground written words and action perception and emotional experiences, that reading becomes a meaningless exercise in word calling. And so, of course, children don't like it. Why, you know, why would they, you know, subject themselves to this complicated process of saying these things when they get very little out of it? And so that's what we try to address by creating a embodied reading comprehension intervention that we call Move by Reading. Um, more recently, as we've gone through successive iterations of this, we've created the EMBRACE system and EMBRACE is a rather complex acronym that stands for um, enhanced moved by reading to accelerate comprehension in English. That's the best acronym I've ever come up with. Well, what the uh, move by reading or embrace intervention consists of is essentially uh, two stages we call physical manipulation and imagined manipulation. And here's how, how it works. This is the way it worked in our, in our uh, absolutely the first initial experiments that we've done, that uh, during physical manipulation, all the children are provided with an introduction to a toy scenario, and the toys are visible 
throughout reading. So they have something like this Fisher-Price farm. And then in the manipulate or the experimental condition um, to ensure the mapping of nouns to objects and the mapping of syntax to action, we ensure that by requiring literal manipulation of objects to simulate the sentences. So the child might read, the farmer drives the tractor to the barn, and then the child would put the farmer into the tractor, thereby establishing the connection between the written symbol farmer and this perceptual sensory motor um, event, child would put the farmer in the tractor and then move the tractor to the barn. In the reread condition, in the control condition, the child reads the sentence and then rereads it to um, roughly balance for the amount of time on task. And the child's told for these sentences to pay a particular attention to them. And it, it's important also to note that the toys are visible for the children in the reread condition. Well, before I show you an example, I also have to point out this one feature of the Fisher-Price barn, namely the hayloft here has a hole in it right there. And the hole is right above the pen where the goat is kept. All right, with that background, let me show you one of the simple types of stories that we started out with. The embrace stories we're using now are much more complex, uh, but uh, based on similar principles. So the child's going to uh, read this little uh, scenario here. When the child sees a green light like this, that's the uh, signal to the child and the manipulate condition to literally manipulate the toys. And it's the signal for the children in the control condition to reread the sentence. And so we're going to listen to this child just reading the first couple of sentences here. Um, and I want you to pay particular attention to what the child says and does when he finishes this sentence. He pushes the hay down the hole. So let's listen. Breakfast. Breakfast. I love breakfast. Ben needs to feed the animals. He pushes the Hey, 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 First, we saw an instance of word calling where the child got here and first tried hayloft and then tried uh, hall. And really, it was only the experimenter that, that got him to, to note that the word is whole. Um, and so even if the child was you know, pretty much willing to go on with anything. But then after this word calling, we then also saw an instance of grounding where the child took this word whole and mapped it to this particular hole in the Fisher-Price toys. And once he did that, once he took that abstract stimulus of the written word and mapped it to a sensory motor representation, well, what we saw next was a miracle. And that miracle was that the child understood and you could see his understanding when he said, well, look, it's going to go to the goat. And if you look, that's exactly the inference that the child has to make in order to understand this text, that the hay goes to the goat when it goes down the hole. Now, note that this isn't a complex inference, but it's the sort of inference that we have to do all the time with all of the texts that we read. We have to take these words and we have to ground them in the right way to get the meaning. 
Otherwise, if we just took the abstract definition of whole, you know, usually an empty space in the ground, this text makes no sense. If, if the farmer needs to feed the animals, why in God's name would he push the hay down a hole, right? That doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense when you ground that to that. And that's how you get that's how you get comprehension. So here are some data from that experiment. Um, we had children doing recall and also answering inference questions. This is the move by reading, the manipulate group, and you can see that they recalled much more information from the text than those children who were told to reread the sentences and think carefully about them. Similarly, the children who manipulated um, answered uh, inference questions more correctly. And it was a pretty sizable effect size here. Um, the second stage uh, is then giving the child the skills to do this on their own when they're reading without having um, the Fisher-Price toys in front of them or without having them manipulate the toys. Um, and so after reading a sentence in the second stage of imagine manipulation, after reading a sentence, the child uses the green light cue to imagine how he or she would manipulate the toys, but the toys are not literally manipulated. But because of the embodied memories, the experiences uh, that are available from previous manipulation, the child is successful in simulating. And in fact, here are the results from other chapters. So the child has manipulated some of the, uh, the chapters, and then we ask them to do imagine manipulation in other chapters. And you can see that the children who had previously manipulated and are now imagining that they're recalling much more and that they're able to make more accurate inferences from the text. And again, with the sizable effect size. Um, and we've replicated this many times, for example, with children reading in groups, with uh, learning disabled Native American children listening, um, with non-disabled Native American children reading, uh, computer-based um, instruction, and a lot of the embrace work we do now is computer-based. Um, we uh, um, had uh, Spanish-speaking children in the Canary Islands do this and had got marvelous results with them, we think, because um, uh, Spanish is a transparent orthography, as I mentioned before. Uh, and in particular, we had this marvelous transfer from one scenario, for example, about the farm, to a second scenario um, reading about uh, non-farm activities. But we also wanted to ask whether the idea of simulation is fundamental to reading comprehension. Is it really something that we do all the time or is it only you know, when we have these children's stories, for example? Um, and, and one way of trying to extend this was to ask whether reading and forcing this simulation um, would help children with math story problems. And there's some interesting findings. Well, the, the logic here is that if children can't understand the story, then they're unlikely to be able to solve the story problem. And there's some interesting findings here about how when children are faced with story problems, many of them engage in the suspension of sense making. That is, they ignore the words and they go right to the numbers and try to manipulate the numbers to come up with some answer rather than trying to use the story to help them solve the math, to use the story to stimulate components of the story that constrain the way the mathematical symbols should be used. Um, and we, we tried to get at this in uh, this experiment. Um, and the way we did it was that we had story problems 
where each story included numerical information that was story relevant, but math problem irrelevant. And there was also, of course, uh, uh, numerical information that was relevant to the math problem, but we included this irrelevant, uh, uh, story relevant, but math problem irrelevant. Here's an example. So children are reading along. Uh, this was done on a computer. Um, originally, when children were first reading, Ray, the protagonist, is sitting down here. Um, Ray enters a talent contest at school. He uses his telekinesis to perform a magic trick. It's his favorite levitation. When objects levitate, they float in the air. Ray is among seven contestants sitting in front of the stage waiting to perform. He's number four. His number is called, and he leaps to the stage. In this experiment, we use these green dots to indicate when a child should uh, manipulate the image, in this case, by using a mouse to, to move the images around. Um, there are two objects on the stage, a computer and a dumbbell. He surprises the audience by making the computer levitate. It weighs 22 pounds. And then it goes on and he levitates the dumbbell that weighs a certain amount. And then the question is, um, how many pounds did Ray levitate in total? And so there's math relevant numerical information like the 22 pounds, but there's also numerical information like the seven and the four that's important for the story, but doesn't have anything to do with the math. And so then here, here are the results. Um, if we're looking at the correct solution of the math problem, we see that the children that manipulated got did much better than the children who did not manipulate. And we can see why, in that the children that manipulated were less likely to use the irrelevant information in their problem solving. We know what they used because we asked the children to write down the numbers that they were using and to write down their um, solutions. And so, yeah, we can see when a child would write down a seven, and include that in trying to understand how much, in trying to compute how much weight was levitated. And so the manipulation made the story more comprehensible so that children could solve the math problem more, um, more correctly. Um, not quite as large of an effect size here, but, but still respectable. Uh, and then this is in the uh, imagine manipulation condition. Again, children now get different stories and uh, they're asked to apply imagine manipulation or the control condition. And again, you can see the better performance um, with the imagine manipulation. So one last um, experiment in this line of research. Um, the question is, do these interventions work for embodied reasons? You know, I've been claiming that what we're doing is teaching children how to simulate, but you know, that claim is mainly based on them doing better. You know, maybe, maybe there are other reasons for them doing better. For example, it's just more fun to play with these toys. Um, and maybe that's why they're they're doing better. Well, in this um, research, um, it was a, a six day procedure. Um, the first day um, we had children, we were measuring EEG, electroencephalogram, um, over motor and visual cortices while children were listening. And then in days two to five, uh, children were randomly assigned to the embodied listening comprehension training. And this was pretty much what you just saw, except instead of reading, children were listening to stories. By the way, these were um, pre-literate uh, pre children in preschool. Um, so they're listening, but when they listen to a sentence, they then manipulate the images after listening versus the control condition where they listen to the sentence and they're told to um, pay careful attention to those sentences. So they have these days of training. 
And then we take EEG over the motor and visual cortices again while they're listening. And the prediction is that improvement in listening comprehension will be correlated with changes in motor and visual cortex activity. That is, if we are teaching children how to simulate using their motor system and their visual system in this case, well, then we should see that any improvements in reading comprehension go along with improvements in or changes in the activity in the motor system and the activity in the visual system. Well, here are the results. These are for the central electrodes that are over the motor areas and are very likely to be influenced by activity in the motor areas. The main dependent variable here uh, on the, on the, um, the x-axis is the change in mu desynchronization from day one to day six. This is a pretty standard measure of motor system activity. And on the y-axis is the change in listening comprehension from day one to day six. And what you can see is this quite extraordinary correlation between the improvement in reading and the increase in activity in the motor system. So that the R squared here, not the R, but the R squared is 0.72. This is in the intervention condition. In the control condition, we don't see much of anything going on. Um, that is, changes in the motor system activity are pretty much not correlated with changes in comprehension. We can also look at the occipital electrodes, the electrodes over visual areas that are generally influenced by activity in the visual system. And again, in the intervention, the change in the desynchronization, that is this measure of visual system activity, is nicely correlated with changes in comprehension so that we have an R32. Uh, whereas in the control condition, again, not much of anything is going on, at least in regard to this relation. And so the conclusion that we come to is that learning to simulate uses motor and visual cortex and improves language comprehension. Okay, a little change of pace here. Um, I was thinking about talking about embodied cognition and mathematics, um, but <laughs> I decided to cut that out pretty much um, in the interest of time, uh, but I wanted to uh, give you some of my, put on the screen here, some of my favorite uh, scientists working in this, um, in this area. Um, and also wanted to give you the, the link to this demonstration. This is a, a published paper, uh, but the paper is mainly uh, there to show off a video of me giving a lecture explaining regression to the mean using embodied um, principles to try to convey the abstract notion of regression to the mean. So instead of uh, working through that, um, I wanted to go to uh, talk about a little bit about embodied cognition and a STEM topic, namely physics. Um, and to go over a couple of, uh, of experiments. Um, this one uh, by Johnson Glenberg and colleagues um, uh, was trying to teach high school students how centripetal force works, you know, what, what this equation for centripetal force really means, where so we have the force needed to keep an object moving around in a circle is equal to the mass of the object times the velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. 
And you know, when you first look at this, it sort of makes sense when you say, all right, well, yeah, you think the force is gonna be related to the mass, the greater the mass, the more force you're gonna need, and the greater the velocity, the more force you're gonna need. But why are we divided by the radius? You know what? What's that all about? And let me give you a little bit of a way of intuiting that. Uh, suppose that you're on roller skates and you're like zooming past a, a pole and uh, you need to stop yourself. And so what you do is that you, you grab, you know, or somebody gives you a, a length of rope attached to the pole. And if it's a long rope, well, although you're zooming past, then you start circling the pole, you know, in a, in a leisurely manner. But if they hand you a short rope, well then, wow, you start whipping around that pole. That is the amount of force is much greater so that the force is inversely related to the radius. Well, the way these investigators tried to teach that to people was by having them do something just like that by, by rotating a uh, object around their head and by manipulating the length of this, um, of this line and by manipulating the weight of the object. And then the person can see the, um, the velocity uh, over on the scale on the floor. And then they tested people and how well they had learned this principles of centripetal force. And what you can see is that, um, in the pretest, you know, neither the embodied group nor the, the less embodied, the low embodied group um, knew very much. And then they both improved for the post test. And then you get the interesting interaction in that the group that did the embodied manipulation, they maintained that knowledge at least over a week whereas the other group started to lose that knowledge over the week. And so we see that an embodied activity it seems like it can help people understand the situation and thereby help them to remember it. One other um, um, experiment along these lines, um, one, of, one of my favorite experiments of all time, um, it's this uh, Contra Lyons Fisher and Bylock experiment teaching college students about angular momentum and vector addition. Again, we're not talking about simple math here or simple physics. We're talking about some complex um, ideas in classical uh, physics. And um, what they did in uh, one group, sort of the, the, what they call the action group, is that they had them hold these uh, spinning uh, bicycle wheels. And if you've never done this, I highly recommend that you give it a try. I have an example here. It doesn't show up very well with the, uh, with the background. Um, but if you just take a, a bicycle wheel like this and you spin it, and the faster you spin it, what happens is that if you try to move it, it fights you. And the faster it's going, the more it fights you. It's just an amazing um, embodied experience of what angular momentum really means. And so they have uh, one group of participants who are literally doing that, another group who are simply observing uh, somebody holding these bicycle wheels. And then they're tested by showing them these two uh, uh, avatars and asking, okay, which one of these two is experiencing the greater um, angular momentum? And here are the data uh, from this experiment. So uh, in one of the experiments, they had people in an MRI while they were um, taking the, the test on angular momentum. And what we're seeing here are those areas of the brain that were differentially active for the action condition versus the observation condition. So again, remember, this is during the test, not when they were literally acting or observing. And so when they're thinking about the test, the differences are that those people in the action condition 
are using parts of the brain, premotor cortex, primary motor cortex, um, that are strongly associated with literal action. So thinking on the test, their motor system is active. And then over here, we see the amazing results. In green here, that's the observation group. And we can see that the green dots are generally lower than the blue dots. And that's indicating that the observation group generally perform worse than those in the action group. And then amazingly, we see this correlation, namely that the more active the motor system was during the test, the better people did on the test. They were using their motor system apparently in solving the test problems. So what are the conclusions from all of this? Well, meaning arises from simulating the action, perceptual, and emotional situation described by sentences, both in stories and in math and in physics contexts. These simulations arise from grounding or mapping the symbol, like words and syntax or numbers, onto experiences encoded in sensory motor and emotional systems. Carefully crafted activity using wheels to experience angular momentum. Carefully crafted activity provides educationally relevant experiences for grounding to foster learning. And one last conclusion is that we really should have known this all along. You know, why, why did it take all of this research in the 20th and 21st century? to convince us of this. When, if we look back at some writing from Maria Montessori, the great Italian educational reformer, um, she wrote in a publication in 1967, one of the greatest mistakes of our day is to think of movement by itself as something apart from the higher functions. Mental development must be connected with movement and be dependent on it. It is vital that educational and practice should become informed by this idea. And then she goes on. Watching a child makes it obvious that the development of his mind comes about through his movements. Mind and movement are parts of the same entity. So in other words, I think what Maria Montessori was saying is that brains are for action. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you. I'd also like to uh, thank the National Science Foundation that's provided for a lot of the funding of the Move by Reading and Embrace Research. Um, several long-term collaborators of mine on the, the reading research, and of course the the many many children and teachers and families. Um, that uh, that participated. Um, and for those of you who uh, would like to read more about um, research on embodiment and education, I recommend this edited book that uh, recently came out by McBride and Fugate, uh, Movement Matters, How Embodied Cognition Informs Teaching and Learning. Um, and this book has been nominated for two book awards, one uh, from the AERA, um, and one from the APA. And so with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Art. That was fantastic. Um, I want to draw everyone's attention to the Q&A. We've got um, quite a few questions that are already populating in that space. I'm going to do my best to try to put them in an order that makes sense for you to talk through Art as you go. Um, but also, if you would like to ask your question, um, just through talking, please raise your hand. And as things go through, I'll actually allow you to talk and uh, use audio. So uh, the first kind of uh, general question that I think uh, would be great to start with is, can you tell us a bit more about how we learn to simulate? Yeah, um, and um, 
Yeah, I'm going to go right back to that example with the baby bottle. Um, I think yeah. it's it's pretty much built into the learning situation, um, uh, particularly when it when it comes to to language. That when parents are explicitly demonstrating to children, they're demonstrating, they're creating the sensory motor information. And then probably it's a matter of heavy and learning. And so we have activity in the brain, in the, 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 the areas of the brain most strongly related to, to language and audition. And we have activity in the sensory motor regions. And then by virtue of those two activities being correlated, um, we have that uh, the situation for learning that when you hear this word, you engage in the simulation. So, it, you know, it's learning in the sense of uh, uh, basic asso associative processes of, of heavy and learning. Um, but yeah, again, and for reading, it's, it's the experiences aren't quite as explicit. Um, and so that's why I think things like uh, move by reading and embrace are necessary for at least, uh, you know, some children to help them learn those, uh, those correlations between the visual symbol um, and the appropriate simulation. Um, so those, those are my guesses. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got quite a few questions about um, kind of a collection of ideas around if you're capable of uh, engaging in the action or engaging in the language, such as situations where uh, your hands are tied or you have a simulation suppression compared to individuals who are paralyzed or have other motor concerns. So I want to read them as they're written. Uh, there are people walking around or moving hands uh, during learning. Uh, I suppose they would learn less uh, if their hands were tied. Would that be the case? Similarly, Pedro asks, or says, thank you, Art, uh, for your wonderful talk. Is there any study exploring the simulation suppression as in articulatory suppression proposed by Alan Baddeley, who happens to be in, in the audience today? Uh, I imagine that a sort of simulation suppression will impoverish the performance on tasks like the ones you presented at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and that prediction as a general prediction has been confirmed a number of times um, in the memory literature in particular, and some in the comprehension literature. Um, not so much on the articulatory suppression um, because, yeah, it's, it's not as clear how to analyze that situation because we're not trying to suppress the, sens the sensory motor system relevant to the meaning. Uh, instead, we're suppressing the sensory motor system relevant to the, yeah, to articulation, to the creation or the, the cognitive instantiation of the symbol. So yeah, I mean, you know, I would imagine that the, that um, articulus, articulation suppression is going to um, affect comprehension, but my guess is that it, it might affect it in a different way or, or not as much as tying the hands or having people lying down. And indeed, there is, um, there is work on this. Um, it, it, you know, like so much in cognitive psychology, uh, it seems to be replicable, but not everybody gets it. And so not every time that people publish one of these sorts of experiments, um, do you see those results? Um, but there are a, a couple that I, that I find striking. Um, one of them is uh, uh, some research of Karamatsas, um, where they showed that people that had difficulty with their hands um, showed a selective difficulty in the mental rotation of hand images, whereas they had no problem with the mental rotation of, for example, feet images. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of selective, that sort of selectivity, I think is, is really, really important. Uh, another um, 
article that I think is, is really nice. I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the names of the authors. Um, it's in the journal Current Biology. Um, and they uh, look at groups of people that have had spinal cord injury, and so they can't walk. And people in the, in the control condition without the spinal cord injury. Um, and they show then that the people who can't walk are selectively impaired in their um, in their perception of of um, their perception of people walking, so that they do don't do as well when when the the stimuli. So these are point light displays of people walking when the stimuli are stimuli are embedded in uh, white noise. Uh, the people with the spinal cord injury, um, their performance suffers relative to the, to the control. But you put them in a more standard visual task, like judging the, the orientation of a visual grading, and there's no difference, you know? And so the problem is that, yeah, when they don't have the motor system to engage in the simulation of walking, well, then their perception of walking is impaired. Um, so yeah, th those are some of my favorite examples of, of this. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Again, especially considering the idea that they had the motor system intact and then experienced some sort of injury. So some of the questions deal with um, a little bit of an earlier developmental sense of can children who are paralyzed or have motor issues learn language or do they have developmental delays in understanding uh, in understanding language? Similarly, um, thanks for the stimulating talk. Could you briefly discuss the implications of embodied learning and language comprehension for children born with motor disabilities such as spina bifida? Yeah, yeah. Um... I don't know about research with spinal bifida in particular, um, but unfortunately, yeah, there is a, uh, seems to be a correlation uh, between motor difficulties and um, acquisition of language. Um, uh, we see a lot of this, uh, the, one of the names of the people who investigates this is Dorothy Bishop. Um, and what Bishop has shown is that taking a, uh, a problem that sounds like it's simply a language problem, it's called um, a specific language impairment. So it makes it sound like, okay, that it's only language. But in fact, what the research has shown is that many of the children with SLI, specific language impairment, in fact, they're clumsy. You know, their, their, their motor systems are not as well developed in some way um, as other children. And um, I think we see that also in instances of, for example, fragile X syndrome. Um, so I have a son, an older son, uh, who has fragile X, and yeah, he, you know, shows also that there's a, you know, there are deficits in language, and hard to tell from what case, but, you know, he also has deficits in the, in the motor system, you know, that he, again, you would classify his motor behavior as sometimes clumsy, um, and you see that with autism spectrum disorder, um, uh, a lot of work of uh, Danny Profits and his student uh, Lincoln Auger uh, show that uh, children with autism yeah, have difficulty with their perception of affordances, particularly bodily affordances. Um, and so, you know, it, it leads to a type of clumsiness. So yeah, but then, okay, so how can we take this and, and help these kids? Yeah, I, I don't have particular answers. You know, I would hope that, yeah, people uh, will be investigating this and, and trying to come up with solutions. Um, so Ashley Adams Sanabria uh, at San Diego State, um, yeah, her, her dissertation work was working with kids who have language impairments and seeing if we can, we can help them through these embodied 
um, interventions and I don't know there was there was some some help but you know it wasn't the huge effects that that we would have hoped to see so I think there's a a lot of opportunity there for people to do uh, to do good work in, in trying to use principles of embodiment yeah, to help out when children are born uh, with motor difficulties. Yeah, that kind of taps into something Vanessa asks. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Do you have recommendations on current best practice approaches that parents can seek out from therapy providers or educators? There's a lot to wade through regarding evaluating efficacy of intervention. So it seems like you're saying that you're, you're in that same boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think some of the best practices, though, are, are things like th that we already know, um, particularly when doing shared book reading with children, both uh, pre-literate children and also children who are learning to read, um, having parents um, read with their children so that this comforting emotional situation, having the parents explicitly draw the links between the words often on one side of the page and the images on the other side of the page. You know, that some children may need to be shown how to go back and forth between the words and the images. Um, and the other good practice we know is not not particularly a body, uh, but that seems to be important. And that's to engage in, in uh, dialogue with the child, you know, while you're reading, you know, ask questions, not just what's this word, but, oh, why do you think that happened? Or, oh, do you remember something in your own life that's similar? And engaging in that dialogue seems to help children understand text better, um, as well as a providing the opportunity for parents to use complex syntax for their children to, to learn about. Thank you. And as a follow-up, Thomas Back um, included a couple of uh, links to literature about impairment of verb processing and understanding of action. So three to be specific, uh, I think they're great. So I'm gonna go ahead and click answer live so that they're in the answered section, but I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at those. Um, so we have a couple of questions about the longevity of uh, this effect and perhaps transfer across training. So for instance, Alan badly asks, is there currently any evidence that this training generalizes beyond the rater specific tasks that are trained? A problem with working memory training? Question mark. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the evidence is as great as I would like, mainly because people haven't looked for it um, rather than negative evidence, you know, just as Alan and, and many others know, yeah, it's, it's hard to devise good transfer um, experiments. Um, so we, we do have, you know, some data showing, you know, transfer of the reading comprehension strategies, these simulation strategies from one story to another story. But then transfer outside of the lab, you know, we haven't looked at that much, uh, transfer to activities, um, for example, from reading comprehension intervention to then, you know, learning in the school. Uh, yeah, we just haven't looked at it. Um, I, I think, you know, part of it is, yeah, getting, children to experience it enough so that it becomes an automatic strategy rather than something that I just use when I'm asked to use it. Um, and yeah, I think it's just going to take a lot more research to hopefully demonstrate that that transfer. But yeah, I mean, we won't know until that that research is done. That kind of also taps into another question about um, how long the benefits last and does it diminish with time if the associated action is not practiced frequently, frequently? So that's your idea of that automaticity factor as opposed to just using it on command. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's pure speculation on my part. Yeah, but I mean, these are great questions. I wish I still had an active lamp that we could, you know, take some <laughs> There's so many great ideas. 
Um, so another question, I was wondering if simply watching scenes with subtitles would help reading comprehension, including scenes that show emotion and movement. So basically disentangling the idea of action versus simulated and imagined action versus just watching somebody else do it. Would this be sufficient for reading? It seems like it would be easier to access versus actually acting out the models, especially the emotional component. Have you thought of using video with captions only as a control? Would you expect a simulation of motor and emotion in this type of control? I can imagine this would not work um, if, I can imagine this would not work if you can't see the concept. Uh-huh, uh-huh, right. So that would that would be difficult and, uh, yeah. Um, so what that reminds me of is some of the work that was done, you know, trying to see if, you know, how much language children get from just watching TV, you know, listening um, and watching TV. And the general answer seems to be not much um, because it's the audio stream on a television program unlike mother ease of your mother, you know, intentionally talking to you about the bottle or intentionally talking to you about the dog. Yeah, on the television, yeah, there isn't that strong linkage, I think, between the words that are spoken and the images and the actions that you see. I mean, or, or it may be that there's a linkage, but it's, it's very statistical, you know, it's only in the long run. Um, so, but, but the question was really about sort of a captioning and would that work? And I think if we created the stimuli um, well enough, it might, but here's what I worry about. We, we know with the act of manipulation, we know that the child is attending to those words and their meaning and the sense of the simulation. We know it because the child picks up the farmer and puts the farmer in the tractor. If the child is simply getting the words as the caption, uh, you know, so the, the, the words on the bottom of the screen are the, the farmer drives the tractor to the barn and you see the farmer getting into the tractor and driving to the barn. Yeah, I'm just not 100%. I mean, some children will be making the mapping and other children won't. And so you're likely to get a washed out effect. Whereas with the manipulation, we know that every child that's doing that manipulation is making that mapping. And I think that's what's behind some of those large effect sizes that I was showing you. Yeah, that brings me to another question here. So thank you um, for, the, for your talk, Art. I was wondering about the role of the neuromodulation techniques um, to causally prove the practical or educational applications of the embodiment theory. What's your opinion about them in this respect? So like TMS, for instance, is things like yeah. Example. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, that TMS uh, can be quite useful um, in demonstrating the relationship between language and, for example, the motor system. Um, we've used it a, a little bit uh, in some published work, um, but whether it would be useful in, in whether it would be useful in investigating sort of this high level comprehension, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I'll just have to think about it more. Um, yeah, certainly I wouldn't want to use TMS on kids. <laughs> you know, it's enough using EEG on kids mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and hoping to get some, some good signal. Yeah, so again, it, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I think as, as a as a research tool, sort of basic research, um, yeah, a TMS can be really powerful um, when trying to do this more applied research or research in, in Pasteur's quadrant. That is applied research that has theoretical implications. Yeah, it's it's just going to need more thought on how to do that. Thank you. Um 
Angela asked another great question. Um, what if students are learning uh, something that's highly abstract? So for instance, artificial intelligence neural networks. Would yeah. simulating an analogy make comprehension more difficult or less meaningful? Um, I'm not sure how to deal with the analogy part of, of the question, uh, but what I'd like to suggest is that there are ways to, uh, to, to encourage simulation of very abstract concepts. Uh, so for example, we saw that with the, the physics um, experiments of uh, you know, swinging something around your head to give you the experiences that then allow you to simulate centripetal force later on, or you know, feeling the, uh, the bicycle tire spinning. Let me get the see thing, there we go. <laughs> Feeling the bicycle tire spinning gives you the experiences that you can use in taking a test on angular momentum. And um, that uh, reference that I gave uh, earlier, see if I can get back to it. Um, yeah, yeah, this reference here uh, is an example of using a lot of gesture and um, yeah, a lot of gesture and a lot of visual information to induce simulations that are important for understanding regression to the mean. And so the general answer is, yeah, I think that it, principles of embodiment can be used effectively in um, teaching abstract concepts. Um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure how, how to deal with the question about analogy. You know, I suppose if, yeah, I can imagine that the analogy, depending on what the analogy was, yeah, it could be beneficial or, or harmful. Right. Um, speaking uh, back again to that rotating bike wheel, uh, Elizabeth asks, do you think contextual variation in the type of experiences given to the learner, rather than just holding a rotating bike wheel, for example, might enhance learning as measured by both increased memory and generalization? Yeah, oh yeah, I think certainly so. Um, and in fact, um, in the, the contra experiment, um, they gave them a, a lot of different types of experiences. And so you can see there's two bicycle wheels here. And the, what they were then able to do was to illustrate when the wheels are going in the same direction and the vectors add, or when they're going in the opposite directions and they subtract uh, for the angular momentum. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different experiences that they embedded in this experiment. And I think, yeah, you almost certainly have to, to provide enough experiences to, 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 to get a, a, a nuanced understanding of these phenomena. Yeah. yeah, I think that also relates to Steve Smith's um, comment. This talk made me rethink my dissertation where imagining the encoding environment aided episodic memory. Maybe it works best when the remember first retrieves their actions involved in getting to and being in their encoding environment. So. Um, I think Steve is absolutely correct, and uh, he needs to redo that dissertation. And I'll be happy to take his degree away until it gets done. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. For those that don't know, that. Steve was my very first uh, PhD student. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, we're both A&M, Texas A&M, uh, I guess Aggies, was, so yes, we have connections. Um, all right, uh, Bob York asks, instructors of physical skills, such as golf or tennis, often instruct beginners by demonstrating the to-be-learned movement. There are a few instructors, though, who tell learners that a given movement is similar to a known movement, such as, in one case, keep a tray with glasses on it level as you bring it back, uh, as you bring it back to shoulder level. Is imitation less effective for learning? 
again, yeah, kind of with this idea of varying uh, context, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't have, I don't have a good answer. Um, I would think, yeah, that that practicing the skill directly. I mean, that seems to me like a good way to go, um, but. I think his, his, I mean, if I'm understanding his question correctly, and, and Bob, feel free to chime in, um, and I'll unmute you if you'd like. It's the idea that instead of saying, this is the action I want you to practice, this is an action you know, transfer it to this context. I think that's what he's getting at there. Yeah, yeah. And um, it sounds like it should work. <laughs> yeah. um, whether it would work better than than practicing the the action directly or maybe there's no way to practice the action directly and so you have to get it through this sort of imitation or successive approximations to the goal to use a Skinnerian term um, and so yeah trying to get our bodies doing the right thing um, through yeah the the analogy of you know one movement to another yeah it sounds like it at, at the very least it would be a, a nice experiment to run mm -hmm. all right lucille asks could vr environments help children with limited motor ability learn to simulate movement and ultimately help with language acquisition yeah that's wow what a great question um Oh, well, and she's I, followed up and said specifically where children are able to enact actions in the VR environment controlled with a brain-computer interface. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of people are investigating um, VR for educational purposes. Um, and I think there's great promise. I hadn't thought about it um in regard to children with motor difficulties but yeah what a what a great idea um uh, another you know good experiment to try um there are two reasons to be however um i want to say skeptical but to keep the expectations low uh lower than we might first think um, and these two reasons come, come from uh, research that I read recently. Um, one is a paper by, uh, well, a series of papers by Jacqueline Snow. And what Snow shows in, in a lot of her work and in a, a, a JEP general article that, that ought to be in press pretty soon, um, is that people's sensory motor reactions to pictures of objects, those reactions are different than their reactions to the objects themselves. That having a 3D object there seems to induce different activity in the, in the brain, in the, the motor system in particular, than a picture of the object, having the actual 3D object there, um, you know, seems to suggest the affordances, uh, seems to get the, um, the motor system more active than, than a picture. The other research, um, just to, to, yeah, keep the expectations a little lower, um, is some work of Glazes um, looking at VR and looking at people manipulating real objects versus manipulating digital objects in VR. And he shows, his group shows that the literal manipulation um, has much stronger effects on changes in the body schema than the um, than the um, simulated interactions versus by by VR, and so not having a literal object that has heft, not having a literal object that 
you know, what, what, what Michael Turvey has shown us is that we learn a lot about the weight of an object and its, its, its uh, distribution of weight through the, the wrist, you know, and how when we're moving that object around, it affects the, the wrist and not having that, those components, yeah, uh, makes the VR situation, as far as we can tell, less effective than the literal manipulation. But on the other hand, wow, the way you described it, having like a brain computer interface, it might be able to, to get around that. So that could be a, a, a really cool idea. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, okay, so Alan and Kurt kind of have similar vein ideas. Alan is interested in how many of the studies have data that are publicly available. And Kurt also says, hi, Art. It seems like the rereading control condition doesn't test whether the embodied cognition manipulation works. An unrelated non-embodied manipulation would have been a better test. I'm concerned about the rereading control is more of a straw man. Who asked that? Kurt Burgess. Uh, oh, Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Um, I have several things to say to Kurt. Um, but yeah, in fact, we did that. We did that in, in one of our experiments um, with just that concern that maybe, yeah, it's the activity, even though it might be unrelated to the text, that's important. Uh, but in fact, when we had children read something, you know, like about the farmer, um, and then go do something else, it made things much worse. Yeah, it was, you know, that sort of unrelated activity, um, yeah, drove down comprehension relative to a control condition. And so really, yeah, we, you know, we, we've been using that rereading as really a control, control for time on task. It may not be the best, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the best that we've been able to come up with. So, so if you're likening the rereading to another question, thank you for your interesting talk, Kristen says, as you stated that brains are for action, do you believe that movements can also aid the learning of cognitive tasks when the movements are not related to the cognitive task that is learned? So kind of the idea that you were talking about when it's an unrelated set of motor responses. Yeah, yeah. you know, there, there is some work in the educational field, like about the benefits of physical activity, of, you know, having given kids a recess you know, and, and uh, having them just move their bodies. Um, so I don't want to say absolutely not, but at least from the theoretical stance that I'm taking, it's, it's hard to see how unrelated movements would be effective in, in the learning. Um, so again, maybe it's best to frame that theoretically from, from the theory of embodied cognition of the sort that I've been developing. Yeah, the movements have to be consonant with the um, underlying conceptualization. Uh, Bob Bjork uh, followed up with um, some additional information. My earlier question was motivated by the finding in applied skills learning that learners of skills do not seem to profit from an instructor demonstrating a skill. One instructor mm -hmm. said, if it looked the way it felt or felt the way it looked, the skill would be a lot easier to learn. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's a really interesting comment of the instructors that, yeah, sometimes, yeah, our visual information does not provide access to the proprioception that might be needed. Um, I recently review, reviewed an article, and I'm pretty sure, yes, it was published in Frontier, so I can talk about it, um, where uh, it, was, it was more of a, of a theoretical argument, but it was about applying these sorts of principles to ballet and, um, how it might be useful for when an instructor, for example, is showing a particular pose for the student to come up to the instructor and push on it, you know, to see how much um, 
yeah, just to, to see, you know, the tension in the particular muscles that the instructor is using to convey a particular emotion in that pose. And again, it's because the, the visual information uh, may not be strong enough. And so, yeah, I, I think that observation that, that Bob brought up, yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting one. Yeah. Um, and then we have one more question. Um, is, does all of this apply, is it the same, if you're learning a new language? I believe so. Uh, I believe so. And there actually are some data that, uh, that demonstrate that. Um, I think some of the nicest data uh, are published by Macedonia, um, where she has people learning a new language. Unfortunately, I think it's an artificial language, but you know, it's it's at least it's at least the beginning of, of research. And of course, in, you know, she would argue with me that there are all sorts of benefits to learning an artificial language. But the point is that when she teaches people the gestures that go along with the words in this artificial language, that they learn the language and retain it. Um, I think that's correct, that they learn it better and they retain it better than when they're um, focused just on the, the sound and the, the spelling of the word. So. so some healthy scientific discord, Kurt Bridges writes again, follow-up comment uh, that your unrelated motoric control produced worse results than the rereading control seems useful for your point of view. The rereading is like a neutral condition, whereas the unrelated motoric condition results in suppression. I'll just kind yeah, of throw that out there. And <laughs> the way I read it also, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Um, I don't see any other uh, comments in the Q&A or any questions to be asked, but Again, um, we still have a little bit of time. If you're interested in voicing your own question, uh, that option is available to you. So feel free to just raise your hand. Um, and if I don't see any of those, we perhaps- I, I, can, uh, I can ask a question if I'm- Oh yeah, you, you, I, I clicked allow to talk for a reason, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, there, there are devices that move, <clears throat> some very sophisticated devices that will move the learner through the whole sequence. Um, I guess you probably anticipate what kind of questions I'd have about that, but uh, um, does that have any potential, do you think? Yeah, I think it probably the potential is less than what it would appear on the surface. Um, yeah, because I think we need to develop our own control of the movement um, in order for... Yeah, to, 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 to learn the, the, the movement. It's that it's not just, you know, where the hand mm -hmm. is, but how it gets there and the amount of forces that have to be um, executed at the various degrees of freedom. Um, you know, but maybe, Bob, maybe there would be a way of thinking about you could learn from that by fighting it, you know, that... Yeah. Um, as, as, yeah, so it's not just a passive movement, uh, but that you are actively generating something to go along with that. I mean, all the way back to when you and I were at the Human Performance Center, Terry Armstrong demonstrated that, you know, uh, devices that gave too much feedback that just kind of corrected for noise in the movement had negative effects. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I, I I don't think I knew that or I didn't remember that. Thank you. Who who was the person again? Uh, Terry Armstrong. It was a device built there in the Human Performance Center and and uh, was able to control the movement and uh, to. It's kind of like there's what what's kind of just noise in the execution may not reflect an actual problem in the learning, and you start correcting that and you inhibit learning. So there's right. kind of what should be the bandwidth of feedback to mm -hmm. learn basically. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Great another talk. terrific talk. Thank you. And so I and I appreciate that very much because it's Bob who taught me how to give a talk. <laughs> Full circle. Full circle. Uh, we have one more question and then we'll probably uh, wrap it up from there. So Elizabeth writes, thank you for your excellent talk. You mentioned Macedonia's work about gesture and word learning. I'm interested in the boundary between iconic gestures, pantomime, and action using real objects and how this affects learning. I wondered about your thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish I had clear thoughts on it. Um, you know, my thought would have been, oh yeah, that the uh, that the working with the real objects would be better than the gesture. But in fact, uh, some of Susan Golden Meadows' work shows that that's not always the case, that sometimes the gesture is more effective um, than, uh, than a pantomime or um, working with, with real objects. And yeah, why that should be, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it has something to do with what, what Bob was just saying, that the gesture sort of glosses over uh, some irrelevant information, uh, making it uh, then easier to learn. But yeah, that, that's just pure speculation on, on my part. Well, I don't see any other hands raised. Is there anything you'd like to say kind of in closing, Bob? Or uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, as we wrap up? <laughs> Oh, you're right. I could have Bob, you know, close for me. Um, no, just thank you, everyone, for those uh, those great questions. I'm glad this is being recorded so that I can go back to those questions. Um, again, um, let me uh, go here to yeah this this book that uh, people may find. Uh, answers more questions than than I was able to uh, to answer. Um, and I hope that at the you know the very least that I've you know gotten people like Kurt Burgess uh, to think uh, seriously about embodiment and uh, yeah, thanks very much to everyone who showed up today. Agreed. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a fantastic day. Goodbye. Goodbye.